me share the PowerPoint. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Carol Waters. I'm an extension educator in Cass County, which is the Weeping Water area. Um, my specialty is commercial fruit and vegetable crops. That's the um, group of folks that I primarily work with. And I'll let David introduce himself. Okay. I'm David Lott. I'm the horticulture educator in North Platte, and I serve West Central Nebraska. And a major part of my work in extension is working with home gardens and farmers markets. So tonight we're going to talk about a few things and we're going to focus on plants tonight. Um, we're going to start with growing environment and then work into planting times, growing strategies and then management considerations. And one spot that I didn't quite get on this slide was we'll talk just briefly about harvesting at the end. So when we talk about growing environment, we're going to talk about plants, land, water and sun. So we start with plant selection, and this is really a key starting point. Um, what plants do you even want to grow? Um, because that determines all your future needs. So we're a little late to start planting big gardens yet, but um, there's still some seed out there. You can still, you still have some time if you wanna grow for market this year, but you really need to decide what do you want to grow? and then look at the rest of your needs. So questions you want to ask yourself are you wanting to grow annuals versus perennials? Asparagus has a very different uh, growing condition than your tomatoes do. So you want to make sure that your perennials are off kind of by themselves where they're not going to be getting a lot of traffic all the time. And then you want to think about seeding directly versus transplanting. David and I were talking briefly before we got started that we've got seeds started um, in our offices and greenhouses and things like that. But in my office, they don't want to uh, start tomato plant seeds because they just want to grow transplants from a local provider, which totally fine as well. So you need to think about, are you seeding are you seeding? Are you growing transplants? Are you seeding directly? What's that look like? And then thinking about that time to harvest because you want to have whoever has the first tomato at market has the corner on the market. You, you can name your price at that point. So you want to think about what that time to harvest looks like. And if you're growing in a high tunnel, you can get a little jump on that. And we'll talk about season extension a little bit later. So thinking about where are you growing and what kind of land do you have access to? Um, so greenhouse media versus soil beds. If you're using greenhouse media, it's um, already sterilized. It's so it's disease free, it's insect free. And it's a good medium to, to start with versus your soil beds, which you want to keep track of and do soil tests, which David's going to talk about soil testing in a little bit. Um, we're also going to talk about raised beds a little bit, um, where we raise the beds of, of the soil, the soil beds themselves. You might put mulches over those. So some considerations there of what do you want? If you're working on soil, straight soil, I would highly, highly encourage soil testing on a regular basis because your pH is so important and you can really easily uh, manipulate that pH to a bad spot. So <laughs> we would encourage you to get a soil test on a regular basis if you're growing in your soil bed. And then aquaponics versus hydroponics. This is kind of a growing trend in gardening right now. So aquaponics is where you have fish plant interactions and hydroponics is where you're growing in basically sterile water with all the fertilizer added to it to grow your your produce um, we have some really nice examples of that at unl right now uh, stacy adams is a professor at unl and an extension 
has an extension appointment and he's growing quite a few things hydroponically in the greenhouse and it's working out really nicely. So if you're ever on campus and, and uh, want to see examples of that, give us a call early on and we can help you arrange that kind of a tour. So soil quality, this goes back to your your seed beds and your soil beds. Um, nutrient quality, like we said, soil testing is pretty much crucial and it determines the needs of your amendments. A lot of people just go out and say, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna use triple 10 and I'm not gonna test. But again, fertilizer will build up. Some things will be used more than others. You can really get yourself into a problem with um, the pH. And that happens a lot if you're using chicken litter as a compost or composted chicken litter. You can really change the pH of your soil fairly quickly that way. And some things that are, take aluminum for example, it likes a higher pH and it becomes more available and you can get some aluminum problems in your plants at that, that point. So you want to really think about getting those soil tests on a regular basis. And then tillage, I can't see the rest of my slide here, but no-till versus strip-till versus complete till, that's really a personal choice. It's up to you. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to each one. Um, no-till is where you, you just kill off the cover crop and plant directly into it. Strip till, you're just, you're tilling strips into whatever cover crop or grass that you have there and making rows that way. And then there's complete till, which a lot of folks do, which is completely tilling the soil prior to planting. And, and tillage can soil, so just be aware of where you're tilling, what you're tilling, how deep you're tilling. David, would you have anything to add to that? We're getting into more thought of getting away from some of the tilling and trying to increase the healthy microbes in the soil, improving soil health. So we have also incorporated lasagna gardening where you're putting layers of cardboard and compost and that builds down. You're increasing your uh, microbe matter and when you have healthy plants at the end of the season, you're cutting them off at the base of the soil if it's a healthy plant and letting those roots rot in there. And so you're increasing the floor <laughs> in the soils. And that, that's a departure from the traditional go out and get the tiller and, and work through it. And it's also a great conservation point for us, especially out in the western half of the state that's very dry, that's very windy. We can have lots of concerns with erosion and and problems that way. So we can incorporate some of these things, some of these tools really easy. There was a question about the glue, the adhesives um, on the cardboard. I haven't had too much of a problem. One of the sources that I have used are the appliance boxes from appliance stores and they are stapled. So you can pull the staples out. And that seems to work pretty low, pretty well. I got to get my battery pack really quick, Carol. Otherwise, I'm going to, my computer's going to die. So I'll let you talk for a minute. Okay. Sorry, folks, I was having some Zoom issues there for a minute. Sorry about um, my my battery pack was, my battery didn't last very long, so we're good to go again. All right, great. So next up is sun, and we're talking about light quality and base. You're jumped out. And then my...
Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Technology is great when it works, but sometimes it just gives you a little bit of a fit. Okay, so now we're back at it. Um, so light quality and space, is your space best suited for the plants? And it depends on what your plants are. This all goes back to plant selection, is how much do your sunlight does your plants need? Some of your leafy greens don't need as much light, so they can do with some partial shade and that can extend your growing season a little bit. And to the point where if it's too much light, do you need to cover them with a shade cloth? Again, you get into those leafy greens. They don't need as much sunlight. They get a little burned on the edges if you leave them out in full sun. And will you need to provide some structural support? So if you have your shade cloth, you're going to have to provide structural support for that. And then water. Water is pretty crucial and it's a big expense for commercial producers, probably one of the biggest expenses that we have um, besides the initial startup costs. So how do you plan to get water where you need it? Um, this can be in a variety of ways, but a lot of commercial production, it's, it's drip line irrigation underneath plastic a lot of times or underneath your mulch. And how much water do your chosen plants need? Because some of them need a lot of water early on. You think about your asparagus, it needs some water getting started in the spring, but after that, you can kind of ignore it after harvest season and let it do its thing for the rest of the summer. It's pretty tough, whereas your tomatoes are going to have to be watered on a regular basis and you have to monitor that with how much rain you're getting as well. So overhead irrigation versus drip hose versus some others. The reason we like drip irrigation is because it's getting the water straight to the root system versus water on the leaves, which is what overhead irrigation will do. And we can actually cause some disease issues. If so, we have to be a little bit careful with the overhead irrigation or the overhead watering. And if you're going to run fertilizer through the system, so if you're going to be using liquid fertilizer, um, you need to think about what kind of system you want to set up prior to when you need it. So <laughs> it's better to make these plans early versus in the middle of July. You're going to have a lot better success rate if you decide if you're going to run your fertilizer through the system now versus setting it up later. You'll be a lot happier, I guarantee you. So David, I believe it's you now. This is the fun part where we talk about the timing. So this timing and the planning really should be going prior to going and seeing when the seeds are available. So this is something that you can be doing in the fall and the winter, and you can be doing some with these crops that we are directly seeding or transplant. So we're going to talk about that. But the first thing is the soil temperature. We have people that want to plant vegetables so bad, whether they're commercial or whether they're a home gardener, just because we've had a long winter and we're ready to go. We want to plant. We want to enjoy. We want to be part of this. But when the soil temperature is not right, we have to wait. So that's what's important. And then we'll talk about counting forwards on our seeded crops that we will direct seed. And then we will count backwards for our long-term crops or our crops that we want um, for fall garden, relay garden, or if you're wanting to have some different timing, because if the temperature is correct and the environment's correct, like Carol said, you could get a jump on someone else market-wise and have produce ready. So you can really time this thing out beautifully if you have the tools to make that happen. Okay, Carol, I'll let you advance the slide. Oh, 
Okay, so soil temperature. This is a soil thermometer. It is about ten to fifteen dollars at your local farm store. It looks like a meat thermometer. Do not use this in a ham or a roast, please. It has the dial that will set that as the face with your minimum soil temperatures on here to plant. And it is a wonderful tool if you take care of it. So it's one that will help you make good decisions based off the soil temperature in that growing environment. So to make this really work, you need to set one location that you're going to test in the garden. So if you have a specific spot that you have in mind, that is the place where you're going to test at the same type of day, same time of day in the same location every day to do that daily testing so you have a consistent reading. So we're gonna shove that thermometer in four inches deep into the soil. We're going to let it calibrate for 15 minutes to get all the swings and the variations out. And then we're going to record our temperature. So we're going to take these temperatures and we're gonna be watching them on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Are you getting four or five days where the temperature's holding pretty steady? That's giving you an indicator that it's about the right time to be planting if you got your target. So that's better than just saying, oh man, it's a beautiful warm day on a Saturday. I'm gonna go out and plant X. This is helping you be more pinpoint specific and it meets the needs for that crop, that minimum soil temperature to grow. So, okay, next slide. This is a wonderful asset that you can check on a regular basis every day. This is the Crop Watch soil temperature page that is kept updated across the state on our weather stations. So you see all these numbers floating around on here. It's cropwatch.unl.edu slash soil temperature. And you have two different screens to look at. You have the left, which is your daily bare soil temperature. So at this point, if we're looking in North Platte in Lincoln County, it's 37 degrees Fahrenheit. If we go look on the right side, we have the average four inch weekly average. That means at four inches deep, like we're shoving our soil thermometer, this is the weekly average. So this constantly updates all the time. So at North Platte, it's sitting at 38 degrees. Scott's Bluff looks like it's at 37 and Kimball and 33. So you can see across the stations, each of these stations are recording sites across the state. When you go to this website, it will roll down and you can find each of these weather stations and the information on the daily average and the weekly average. But it's really good to use the weekly average so you know that there's a trend that takes out all the variation because you can have a really warm day or a really cold day and it can the temperature still can fluctuate. We do have buffering action with being in the ground. If you are in a container or a raised bed, there is going to be more chance for variation of big jumps or big drops in soil temperature, depending on the weather. And remember, we don't have that buffering action of the, of the, of the ground when we're in a container or a raised bed, especially if we have a, a raised bed that has been built with tin, for instance, uh, or galvanized, those sides are gonna warm up really, really fast. So always check the core of, the, uh, of that raised bed because that's a little bit more of a reflective median temperature versus the ends. Your ends are always gonna be warm, which you could use as something to manipulate. Maybe your, your edges are warm and you're just about time to plant radishes, for instance or something short like lettuce. You can plant in those warm hot spots. You can manipulate the warm and cool spots in a container just because the sides warm up and it'll take longer for the center to warm up or cool down either way. So this is a great resource. If you don't have the soil thermometer, use this. But when you use your soil thermometer, you're collecting pinpoint readings on a daily basis 
for your garden. So there's still going to be a lot of variation across the state and even in a county, let alone living being across town. So or the other section to the east or the west or north south. So um, these are just really good tools that are not expensive for you to have success with to pinpoint when to plant those crops. OK, next slide. And that's based on temperature. So that tells us. And so this is the optimal soil temperature for different seeds to germinate and the number of days for seedlings to emerge. So it's going to, you know, we're starting out at freezing, a freezing soil. Uh, nothing's going to really be working too well, is it? And then you're going to start to see some crops. So let's say we're at 41 degrees and carrots are going to take 51 days. <laughs> so, so look at this as your as your slide chart here on how many number of days it's going to take. So if we take carrots, for example, at 42 to, at 41 degrees, it'll take 51 days. When we get up to 50, that number drops down to 17. So you can see about the importance of the soil temperature in just 10 and nine degrees Fahrenheit, the number of days to germination rapidly shrinks. And then we can take that a step further. When we get to 59 degrees, it's only going to take 10 days for that carrot seed to germinate. So this is a really good table for you to watch and look on what can be planted when and how many days. So it can kind of tell you what the optimal time is. You can also look at your seed packets and it'll say once you plant how many days to germination match that amount of days with this chart on the temperature and that'll tell you how many days you really need or what soil temperature you really need to have on the ground before you plant so match the data on this table with the data on the seed packet you can also use this table i'm going to interrupt david i'm sorry you can also use this table to look at starting seeds mm -hmm. so you can see the difference between just having at room temperature, say at 68 or even 59 for people who like it a little lower um, mm -hmm. versus putting a, a heat mat underneath those trays and bumping it up to almost, you know, to 77. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a much faster seeding rate that way. Absolutely. And the seeding mats do make a difference of warming those up. It will get those to pop. We do have a question here. Will these slides be available for reference later? Absolutely. We do have those and in Ogallala here in the classroom, I printed them off. So we will make those available for you to reference. So it tells you at 104 degrees, really nothing's going to germinate outside of turnips. It'll take three days for turnips to germinate. So they can withstand a lot at the hot so okay next slide please okay so when we count forward and these are for the seeded crops that we're going to directly seed we're going to look at the seed packet and see how many days it is to maturity but that's not all you need to also count another 14 days in to a, for our harvest period as well so that may be maturity but you need some more time for things to be harvestable size and that's not accounting thinning out. So it'll tell you how many seeds to plant per inch and how deep, so the, the width and the depth, and then how much space between the rows. But we wanna make sure that we have the right spacing so those seeds can grow to the correct size they need to go. So for instance, if your soil temperature is correct for your carrots at, let's say, what was it, 59 degrees, Carol? So that's that's a good time, pretty good time to be planting. So you're going to plant, and it says 55 days. So once you reach your 59 degrees soil temp, then you're going to start from that day that you planted. That's that's the day you planted. The next day is day one, and then you're going to write the days down from one to 55 on your calendar. And I use a cheap calendar that 
uh, I get from, we get extras at the extension office. So day two is the, the day after is when you count day one. And I just write those days down in color code, knowing what the crop is. So I get to 55. So it should be mature and technically by calendar at 55 days. And then we're going to add another 14 days to account for your um, for your harvest period. Now, after September 1st, depending on the crop, because some things take longer, some are long season vegetables, you may have to add 14 more days for what we call fall factor, meaning the nights are cooling off a little bit more, a little bit more after September 1, and the growth rate's going to slow down, so you need to account for that. So if you have things that are going to grow into September, add 14 more days so you can account for those for harvest because things will not be uh, maturing as fast. And then we have our transplanted crops. So it's really important to monitor the, monitor the soil temperature before you plant transplant crops, meaning the peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, all the things that you can buy as transplants. And I will tell you, you need to harden those transplant 14 days outside in the environment. So start out first in an area where it's kind of protected outside and bring it in, especially if there's chance of a frost. The next day, take it outside again, this time a little further away from, from protection in this back and forth process for 14 days. This toughens those tender plants that are transplants uh, before you plant them in the ground or the container or the raised bed. So you need to do that. That's a key factor. So once you have the right soil temperature and you've tr you've hardened these plants off, now you're going to plant them into the ground. They met that soil temperature need, and you're going to count the number of days for maturity once again. So if you have a tomato that takes 65 days from the day of planting, Let's just say May 15th is your planting day. All the, the plants are hardened. You've done everything correctly. Your soil temperature is your optimal 60 degrees minimum. You start counting the next day. So May 16th will be day one. And you're going to count to 65. And, and that, that's the maturity. Then you've got your maturity time. Tag on another 14 for your harvest. And that will tell you roughly about when you can expect some production. It does matter on some crops that uh, they're going to take a little longer by their growth types. So a determinant type tomato is going to grow up to its determined height, and it's going to produce its produce in about a two, three week window, most of it versus a indeterminate tomato that's going to keep growing and keep growing and you'll get sporadic production throughout the year all the way to the frost. So think about that as a, a consideration. So we have gotten to the point where you can buy vine crops that are transplants. So you can buy cucumbers and you can buy pumpkins, you can buy melons as transplants. So you need to know the, the minimum temperature for them and count out the number of days. But we also need to be worry, worry about the frost tender factor. So is this something that, what, is it a long enough growing season, hopefully, that you can grow it and you can harvest it before a frost is going to damage it? So that's going to be another thing to think about. So um, something like lima beans take quite a while, for instance. They want a warm temperature and then they're over 100 days. Do you have enough time? In some parts of Nebraska, the answer would probably be no. Because we have just a short enough growing season, you won't see them to maturity, for instance. So those are just some things of counting forward, thinking about making sure that you're picking cultivars that will be able to grow once you get the right soil temperature and the number of days plus the harvest period plus any fall factor so you can actually get the most out of your production before a freeze hits that would destroy that crop for instance and david we had a question we had a question in the chat um just for clarification 
when he's talking about for transplant crops, that's if you're seeding them and transplanting them yourself, you need to harden them mm -hmm. off. If yes. you're buying in transplants, they're hardened off before you buy them. Mm -hmm. They should have done that for you ahead. They should have done that because otherwise they're really weak and they're really tender. So um, that's something to always think about. But so, I just wanted to clarify that real quick. Sure. When you grow your own, you need to harden those transplants. That that's that, that's a have to. That's a that, that's a requirement because you'll be really disappointed. And we see tomatoes and trans, of course, tomatoes because. If anyone grows anything, it will be a tomato. We see people buying them way too early and then planting them way too early. And then that plant is stunted uh, and it just doesn't produce. So, you know, we can try to cheat Mother Nature, but Mother Nature usually gets the last laugh. And soil temperature is just a huge key factor, especially on warm crops such as melons, your beans, your tomatoes and peppers and your eggplants all need warm temperatures. Don't try to cheat the system. The only other thing I could think of, Carol, would be if you were to solarize the piece of ground and try to warm it that way, which some people will do. So, okay. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to do counting backwards. And this is really good for relay planting, meaning you're going to plant one batch of beans and then you're going to wait two more weeks and you're going to plant another batch of green beans or maybe you want to do some fall cabbage and you've grown your own transplants and you want to plant a second planting and they'll be ready in the fall when it's really nice and crisp and, and sweeter flavored because the, the nights cool down and the sugars build up so it's ideal for your vine crops to count backwards beans cabbage leafy greens radishes all this and it's based on your first frost date. So knowing where your first frost date is, is really important. So that is your starting point. So you're going to start the day before is your day one. So if you have an uh, October 15th frost date, average frost date, you're going to count day one as August um, 14th. 15th is a frost date on average. So 14 is day one. And you're going to count backwards the number of days to tell you when you need to you need to start planting and so it's really important you can also add the fall factor in now you may not have to worry so much about radishes because they're here and gone and you don't have to worry about it or leaf lettuce but for green beans yes that's going to slow things down so you would add the fall factor and if you're using a frost tender crop that can be damaged by a light frost, you'll want to add another 14 days after that. So it's not only the days to maturity, but you're adding 14 for fall factor and you're adding another for frost tender, depending on the crops. So we have people that'll do a second planting of tomatoes, for instance. They'll have their May planting and then they're going to count backwards for another planting for fall. You just have to make sure you have enough time there to get them planted in in time. So it's really important. And just a cheap calendar that you pick up from the parts store, the farm store, wherever. You know, a lot of times businesses will give you one, works great. So those are perfect to write on. And I have one in my bag I can show you as an example later on. So we're going to move on to some growing strategies and we're going to cover some things like crop rotation, intercropping, succession planting. We're going to talk a little bit about a season extension, but that's one of those topics that we could do a whole night just on season extension um, and plastic mulches. And then some trellising, staking barriers, and then some fall planting. So crop rotation is really important because many pathogens infect all crops in the same family. So you want, they'll build up over time. Um, and again, with, same with pathogens, so plant diseases, they can infect crops from several different families. Um, so you wanna rotate between those families at least every two to three years. And this becomes even more important in high tunnel situations where it can build up in a smaller space. 
you've created a really perfect scenario for plant diseases. So you want to make sure that you're you're taking your tomato family and and trading it out if if at all possible every year, um, just because we don't want to build up tomato pathogens. So you really want to look at what's in your tomato family, like your peppers, your eggplant, your tomatoes, and understand what you're planting, what family it's in, and then be willing to swap, like I said, rotate them out every two to three years. So you don't want your tomatoes in the same spot every single year. Um, what's funny is a lot of times people say, well, I've planted tomatoes in the spot every year since 1985. And I say, yeah, <laughs> and they may still grow okay, but what's your yield looking like? Your yield's going to decrease or you're going to be putting on a lot more chemical, which is increasing your cost of production. And we'll talk a, a lot more about the business impact of it next week, but you're trying to keep your cost low and your profit high. Otherwise you wouldn't be growing for business. And I would encourage you in your, your calendar or whatever record keeping you do, get a small notebook and, and plot out where everything was. Because if you're anything like me, if I don't write it down, I'm not gonna remember it next year for sure. So was the tomatoes in this plot or was it in the plot Two, two spots down. It seems like we'll remember that stuff forever. But as one of my master gardeners used to say, I have some timers, sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't. And so writing down really helps remembering these things. And it's just good for management tools too. Intercropping is a way to maximize your space and time with crop mixes. So you can see where you're in this picture, they've really intensely planted, it looks like some lettuce and some carrots together. So they're going to plant them really close together. The lettuce is going to grow, they're going to harvest, leave the carrots alone. And that way they can, once the lettuce is done, they can replant that with something else, the carrots will still keep growing in between. So you want to use different maturity times and plant sizes to really maximize production. And what that means is you want to make sure that you're having your um, maturity times come at a time when it's in season. You don't want lettuces too late because they're going to be a little bit bitter. You want them earlier in the season, whereas your carrots are going to be a longer term crop. This is ideal for producing extra crops of fast maturing crops like our lettuces, our leafy greens, spinach, radishes. And this is one of this is one of those slides where you have a resource for intercropping and it's from the University of Minnesota. So if you've seen your mail today, your email today, I sent you a message. Um, it has a lot of different resources. If you're there on site with David, you have it in your hand already. And uh, I think he has extra copies. So if you don't have a printer at home and you're over on his neck of the woods, hit him up and he'll have plenty of copies for you. Succession planting. And this is something that's kind of crucial for market gardeners. And this is where planning ahead is so important and putting your plan on paper before you start to implement it in the summer. So this is really ideal for tight garden spaces because you're you're doing crop mixes and this is we're going to have lettuce and we're going to have another bed of lettuce next to it that's planted maybe two weeks later next to that's going to be some spinach. And we're going to as as the lettuce in the first bed um, matures and kind of wears out we can start looking at maybe that's the new green bean spot so we plant our green beans and then we we take the second lettuce spot that's you know had two two more weeks of production on it and now it's ready to go so maybe we're putting in transplants of tomatoes there 
and now you have your spinach over here. So maybe that becomes the pepper plot. So this is ideal for tight garden spaces where you have to really think about what are we transitioning in and out during the different seasons. So you wanna to string together crop sequences from spring through fall to really maximize that ground. So you're getting um, good production and good harvest off that ground all season long. So you wanna utilize a mix of short, medium and long maturing crops and um, that'll help make sure your land is still in production as you go along. Season extension, there's lots of ways to, to do season extension. And these are just a few of them. This is floating row covers. And you can see that we use a lot of that for our really early spring crops. Looks like we've got a question. Ah. Um, so we do a lot of season extension. We can start a little bit earlier in the spring with getting our lettuces out. If we just use a floating row cover that keeps that cold air off of them at night. And we've seen even up in, into May easily that we need some row covers or something to cover those tender uh, gardens. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been known to get a little excited a little too early. Today I'm, I'm trying to talk people out of their garden because it's, it's currently 71 degrees and sunny in Omaha as the sun goes down. It got up to almost 80 today, so probably people are getting really twitchy and wanting to go out and work in the garden. And I'm really trying to hold them back and say, no, no, you need to wait just a little bit longer. Um, Otherwise, they're going to get in a situation where they have to go out every day and put the, the row covers on, make sure those tender annuals are, are being protected every day. So this is something, season extension is a great way to be that first one at the market with cabbages and, and lettuces and spinach and things like that. But it's also a little more labor intensive because you have to manage it on a daily basis. It's also a great tool to use in the late fall to have some protection on the other end. So it works for really early and really late. Uh, there's enough temperature difference to keep things from the frost. So you can use uh, you can use the row floating row covers within a high tunnel. So we've done that in our experiment, our high tunnel at the research farm in North Platte as well. So know that you can put you can put tunnels within tunnels within tunnels. Yeah. And you can do protective layers that are really cool. You can see some of these are PVC pipes that are really bendable or they're, they can be expensive or they can be the fabric and some boards and some bricks. So don't overthink it cost-wise. It can be very cost-effective. The biggest thing is just managing that daytime temperature you want to make sure that you're not it's not getting too hot under those row covers during the day so you like i said it's a little more management intensive where you have to go out and remove it every day plastic mulches um there's a lot of research and a lot of people use plastic mulches and you can see in the the picture on the left hand side there's drip irrigation running straight through the middle of the um, plastic mulch beds. And these are laid with a, a layer, a plastic layer. And the drip tape is put underneath as they lay that mulch bed. And it makes a really nice spot for um, to transplant into. It warms up the ground just a little bit faster, typically. And it also holds moisture in really well during the summer. So highly encourage looking at that as an option. There's also been some research of different colored mulch, plastic mulches doing different things for the plant. And I know Dr. Sam Wartman has worked a little bit on that here recently with strawberries and colored mulches. Um, so if you're interested in that research, I believe he has it up on some of his websites.
and then trellising, staking, and barriers. So this is ideal for your beans, your vine crops, uh, like your cucumbers and your tomatoes. It provi provides a growing environment for the plant to really grow on a structure, and this helps avoid damage and disease. If you don't trellis or stake your tomatoes, especially those indeterminate tomatoes, they're prone to breakage and any uh, foliage that's on the ground is also more susceptible to disease. So getting that foliage up off the ground, kind of away from the water source will really help with that disease management. And it also helps improve airflow for plants with um, avoiding those disease problems too. And it helps you maximize your space in the garden vertically. So think about planting up versus just planting on the ground. And I don't know about you, but harvesting cucumbers and green beans, I'm bending down all day. I think that's another benefit to trellising or staking is it's a little bit easier on the back when it comes time to harvest. Livestock panels are very popular out here. Livestock panels are great. They also make a nice arch. Mm -hmm. You can bend them to make an arch. They can go straight up, they can be bent, you can shape them. So it's really handy. We have a lot of those that are available used for sale. So you do not have to buy brand new. You can buy off of buy seller trade pages on social media or local auctions. So you're maximizing your bang for the buck looking for some of these things. Uh, so farm sales can be some of your best friends for some of these uh, for some of these tricks, and I really encourage you to try them out. The question we had a question in the chat about what about using twine to build your own trellising? You can do that. Um, twine is just not as sturdy sometimes, so it sometimes tend to tends to rub on whatever it's tied to and it might break. So just be aware that that's a issue that you might run into, but you can easily use twine for trellising. On tomatoes, you can put your stakes down and then you can do what they call the Florida weave with twine back and forth. And we can show you a picture of what the Florida weave looks like. But like Carol says, they're going to grow and they're going to rub into that twine. So that is something you do have to think about. And sometimes we've actually had tomatoes stuck between the twine where they grew into it. You know, you get those surprises even in a tomato plant where it's growing. So it is an option and you can take your tea posts and and use the twine and you build it from the bottom up, basically. So you start your plants and as they grow, you're going to put on another layer of twine. And as it keeps on growing, adding another layer of twine to keep them held up and, and growing. Biggest thing is airflow, especially on these crops. You want good airflow to help reduce disease as well. And so that's another benefit of trellising and staking. Yeah. So it's not too early to start thinking about fall planting already. <laughs> so... You wanna consider fall gardening for this next year. Um, you can cut off the healthy plants at the soil line. You wanna compost your healthy plant materials, remove and destroy any diseased plant materials because you don't want that, it has a higher rate to be killed at. You don't want that in your compost to just spread it to your tomatoes next year or to whatever crop you had a disease in. And then you can add in a cover crop where intended crops are finished and build a strategic growing plan for the next year based on those rotations. So it all goes back to that crop rotation and what plants do you wanna grow? Um, really planning it out on paper and looking at it ahead of time will decrease your inputs and increase your profit margin. So you can make some management decisions. Ooh, what are some good cover crops? We are going to get to cover crops here in just a second, and I'll let David talk about some cover crops. Ooh, I went one too far. And David, I believe this is you. 
and you're on mute. It would help that I take the mute off. Uh, so what we're talking about now are some good alternatives for pest control and using those good cultural methods without going straight to the insecticide or the herbicide. We're gonna talk about cover crops and all of these publications are noted in that email. So I will show you screenshots and pictures of things and they are in that email that you received from Carol earlier with all those resources for you to download. And if you want me to, I can go over to the table and pick those up and show you on the screen if you like. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is not the greatest picture on the screen. Hopefully you have a big enough screen to see this. This is a diagram of the plant families. This is done, uh, put together by Cornell Extension, who is really one of the leaders in the vegetable world for us in Extension. So we talk about the different plant families and we had a real simple graphic from the University of Minnesota that talks about how we can break it down into four, but here are all the four the families that we're gonna be working with. So our alliums, so you think about the allium bulbs that have the really pretty um, stalk and then the star-like flower, that's an allium. Well, it's related to your chives and your onions and your garlic, and your leeks, so perennials, onions, and shallots. So they're all in one family. Our next family would be amaranth. You can grow amaranth as a crop. Uh, it is a very cultural specific crop to raise uh, depending on some of the markets and some of the uh, people that might be buying amaranth, you can buy it. Um, in some of our rural areas, people would wonder what is wrong with you because we're trying to get rid of amaranth, but you can harvest the seeds off the amaranth as a food crop. The brassicas are basically also your mustard family. These are your, your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, your cauliflower, your bok choy, your collards, horseradishes, kohlrabi, all these. These are your cool season crops that we can plant early in the spring and then harvest in the, uh, in, in the spring. And then we can also have fall brassicas available to harvest. And what's really nice if you plant your broccoli and your cauliflower and your cabbage and it gets too hot too soon, because we do have spring times that last two weeks and we go straight into the heat, that can affect the flavor of these crops kind of easy. And so if we can have a fall crop of these, the nights cool down and the sugars build up because of those cooler night temperatures, you will have sweeter tasting produce in the fall. So that's one of the tricks. So this is something that people really enjoy in the fall that are ready to enjoy that. And then we talk about uh, the, the compost, uh, the, the composite family. This is also the sunflower family, the, also known as Asteraceae. This is a giant family. So sunflowers, lettuce, a Jerusalem artichokes, endive, chicory. Some people raise chicory further down south and artichokes are all members of this family. This is a gigantic botanical family. This family also includes your dandelions and your thistles. So if you wonder why sometimes wild lettuce looks like a thistle is because it is a relative, it's in the same family. Then you have the cucurbits, This is your, these are your vine crops. So your gourds, your cucumbers, pumpkins, your summer and winter squash, your watermelons and zucchini are all in this family. Your goosefoot family, which is a neat family, are your beets, your Swiss chard, um, and your spinach. Uh, the grains such as barley, corn, oats, rice, rye, and wheat, which is just good to know. A lot of times the only thing we would really raise out of here would be sweet corn. Uh, you can use barley as a cover crop potentially. Um, your legumes are your peas and your beans. Uh, Family is also known as Fabaceae. So we have false indigo in the landscape that's also in that family. These are your nitrogen fixers. The lily family. So you can eat your lilies in the form of asparagus. So that family is Liliaceae. Uh, your mallow family. So if you think of your 
uh, your hibiscus that grow in the containers or the perennial hibiscus that come up every year. They produce that beautiful flower. If you've ever grown an okra plant, they have a similar type of flower. Kind of reminds you of a hibiscus. Well, they're related. So they're all in the mallow family, malvaceae. Um, the mint family, so basil, mint, oregano, sage. Um, this family is called Laniaceae, or you may have heard it called Labiatae. And so it's that that is a family that's um, very popular in our herbs. Uh, one word of warning, some of our herbs, our, our mints, will go crazy on you and they will grow. You start at one place and it'll keep growing everywhere else. So this is uh, especially your mints and some of your herbs, you want to contain them so they don't grow in places you don't want them to. So they will spread very fast. The morning glory family is your sweet potato. So if you've ever seen a sweet potato bloom, it looks very similar to the morning glory. So that shouldn't be a surprise. Your nightshade family are your is your number one family, most popular family in the garden. So your peppers, your potatoes, your tomatoes, and your eggplant are all members of those. If you've ever seen nightshade and it looks like a little itty bitty tomato or a ground cherry, that's why they're related. Early colonists would not eat tomatoes because they were very concerned that they were eating something poisonous because they were thinking of the nightshade. Thomas Jefferson was a botanist and a horticulturalist on the side, and he helped make tomatoes be a popular crop in the American colonies. He brought the seeds back from France. He was a lover of European studies and botany, and he would grow the gardens at the Monticello, and that included the tomatoes. So he helped make tomatoes be something safe to eat, but you are wise to know that you do have a relative that is toxic. Then you also have your uh, your rose family. So your apples and pears are in the rose family. Also strawberries, the smartweed family, which is your buckwheat and your rhubarb. So remember the stalks on the rhubarb are what we eat. The leaves are not are not for us to eat. They are toxic. Um, and then your umbels. So think about an umbrella. So when you see celery or you see carrots go to seed where they where they bloom, they bolt and they go up and they make a bloom and it looks like an umbrella. So think about those. So just some little tricks to help you remember uh, some of these common plant families. And so it's always good to rotate by family. And there's a reason why Carol described it is we want to keep the pathogen bacteria load from these crops down in the soil. We want to break those disease cycles. And when we break those disease cycles, we also are becoming less reliant on herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, all the chemicals that we use is what we call rescue treatment. If we just follow the rotations, we can be less dependent on chemicals. Okay, that's one quick trick. Okay, next slide. Okay, so pest control, and there are three different publications that I put here. One was on uh, cultural control, meaning non-chemical. It talks about your, your barriers, your uh, crop rotations, your mechanical control where you're literally pulling uh, different things like that from Oklahoma State. There's another one on integrated pest management in the garden where you're encouraging, uh, you're using your floating row covers so you're controlling things like the cabbage looper moth from coming in and doing the damage because your floating row cover is creating a barrier in this case. Not only is it getting you some season extension in the beginning and the end, but it's also serving as a control for the pest. And then also a publication from Oregon State Extension on how to encourage the beneficial insects into the garden. So you're, you're planting other plants, maybe not for harvest to sell, but you're raising them to bring in such as your, your ladybugs, your wheel bugs, your assassin bugs, the pirate bug, uh, your green and brown weight lace wings that all come in and are natural predators on aphids and whiteflies and thrips. So all really good 
package of information for you to sit down and read and, and piece it all together. So you can introduce uh, herbs and some of your perennials, some of your wildflowers are great attractants to good insects on, on this list that will help control some of your pests naturally. We also can use some of our bedding plants. There's some talk about you know using the marigold because it has such a strong oil scent that drives some of other insect pests away. And so it's always good to know the correct ID of the insect before you try to kill it. Sometimes we kill off the good insects and don't realize it and know our insect problems and our disease problems. So we do the right type of control and using those integrated pest management tools that are in the tool belt that we have shared with you. And when you pull off your publications, you'll see things that you can do to avoid adding the chemicals back into the garden. Okay, next slide. Now we asked about the cover crops. Here are some really common cover crops for home vegetable gardeners and for farmers market gardeners. And so this is from the University of Wisconsin Extension. And it's one of the publications in your email or are printed out here on the table. Here's the link to it on the web. And so it talks about when you would plant it and then your, your spacings and does it fix nitrogen? So on crops that are heavy feeders that use a lot of nutrients, you can add some nutrients back with some of your cover crops and you're adding some nitrogen back, which is great. In our case, also in arid areas, it also helps control erosion in the fall and the winter. So it also talks about your grass, your growth rate, whether it's uh, fast, most of these are fast, with the exception of your clover and your oats, and then some of the comments on what you would use it for. So it's, it's really nice. Um, so clover, for example, works good in high pH soils. And our soils across the state, a lot of times are seven and a half and higher. So they like growing in that environment. So it works very handy, for instance. So this is just a really great table. This is the big table I wanted to show you on this slide. And then you have the whole entire publication. So you do some compare, contrast, and use it as you want. So maybe part of the field or part of the uh, operation, you want to plant into a cover crop and rest the ground. Maybe you're not using the whole 30 by 30 we talked about. Plant into a cover crop, let it fix some nitrogen for you. Then you can open it back up for another spot. It gives you another space to rotate with. So just really easy little steps that you can do that makes life so much easier. So um, now we talked about the toolbox. So mechanical control, that is literally physically removing it. That's pulling the weeds. The next one is the barrier control, which is like the floating row cover that keeps the cabbage looper moth from laying the eggs. Crop rotations, breaking up those insect and disease cycles. Um, I have a University of California publication that talks about the plant families in your packet. And it'll talk about which insect pests they tend to attract, for instance. So be on the lookout, especially your mustard family, your brassicas tend to bring in some not so nice friends. So you want to rotate them for that reason also, not for also the soil borne part, but the insect pest part. <clears throat> introducing your natural control, your beneficial insects. So maybe you plant some coneflowers on the border or some um, fennel, for instance. You're going to bring in some great friends that are going to help you eat some of the bad insects in the garden. And then the chemical control, which is the last option, ideally. So it's kind of one of those break in the case of emergency. So we're trying to reduce our pest use, pesticide use is it, sometimes you have to use it. And when we do, there are specific rules. So, and that's the next slide. Okay, so best practices. Know when produce is ripe to harvest first. You need to know if you're going to apply a pesticide, how many days you need to wait before you harvest it. So if you're too close to harvest, maybe you don't apply that product. 
You need to know that. And that's on the label. The label of any product chemical wise is a legal document in the state of Nebraska. And we need to follow that completely, especially, 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 especially if we're selling it to someone else to eat or even giving it. So we always need to know that. Uh, we need to use clean, sharp harvest tools and containers and make sure that we keep them clean so we're not accidentally moving pathogens around on accident. When we use wagons and carts and tubs, you know, the old, old dish tub, make sure you, you wash it. You wash, you, when you wash, you're going to wash with hot water and soap. You're going to remove the debris first and then you can wipe down with a Clorox wipe or you can rinse the tub with a 10% um, bleach solution after you wash and then let it air dry. Simple as that. So to get a 10% bleach solution, it's one part of bleach to nine parts of water to get your 10%. Um, do not harvest when you are fighting a cold or you're sick. You don't want to accidentally transmit um, an illness onto the produce because especially if we're eating it raw, there's no kill step. So we don't want to accidentally pass that on and someone else handles it, but also they're cutting it and serving it. That's going straight into the produce. So beware of that. Uh, wear clean clothes and make sure your shoes are clean when harvesting and going in the garden. Your feet, just like tires on a tractor or a vehicle, are really good ways to bring in pathogens into a garden plot on accident. Keep domestic animals out of the garden area. We do not need their feces or their feet in that area. I know some people will talk about letting their chickens run through the garden. If we're selling to market, we don't need to be doing that. You need to keep those animals pinned up and away. Um, because of the next thing is the 180 day manure rule. So if we're selling for market and we have to go through a third party audit, when we're a big enough operation, we have to show records of use our manure use that it's 180 days from before the date of harvest. And it's not just 180 days, but what type of product are we harvesting? So if it is a product like a carrot that is going to be growing in the soil, then definitely it has to be 180 days. If it's sweet corn, the sweet corn is usually suspended on a stock that we're taking off of the stock. That's a little different, but remember the edible portion cannot be in contact with raw manure. So that's really important. And that really will help us reduce the bacterial load and the potential movement of a pathogen for someone to eat on accident. Okay, next slide. So there you go. Um, we were talking about the herbicides when we know the label and we're going to follow the label instructions and also never underestimate the importance of protective equipment. Uh, some of these products can be very potent and we do not want you to be exposed or the or the edible portion of the plant to be exposed on accident. So we do not want you to get sick. And there's a reason why it's on the label to be safe. So we wanna thank you for being here tonight. Are there any questions? We, we have plenty of time for plenty of questions. I'm gonna stop the share real quick. Oh, and David's showing you his calendar. So I'll let him talk about his calendar. This is the calendar that the Nebraska Poultry Association drops off at the extension office. So I take my calendar and I start marking things out. And we use this for a previous program. So when we're looking at fall gardening, for instance, here we are, we're in October here. And if October 15th is our day that we have a 95% chance of a frost, we're gonna start counting backwards from the day before. So this will be day one, day two, day three, day four. You can go right on through, that's really easy. And 
gosh, most people are giving away calendars for us to use. We also have a link for the evaluation form. So there are eight questions, very simple. Please just fill it out for us. It will not take long at all because we need to have some information to help us do a better job meeting your needs and the information if it was helpful or not to you. And Chase, to answer your question, there was a question of, is there any way to get recordings or anything? Um, yes, we will be posting that probably in the next day or two. Um, I'll, I'll give a personal plug right now for the Nebraska Grows Facebook page. And it's exactly how I said it, Nebraska spelled out grows. It's also a podcast, so you can follow Nebraska Grows podcast, which um, I host and I talk to um, different specialists, different educators uh, about different growing for market topics. David is is one of those experts I've already talked to on the podcast, so you can uh, check that out at your favorite podcast provider. David, here's a question. Does soil temperature matter for all, all crops or just the tender ones? They matter for all of them because some crops such as okra require 70 degrees soil temperature. That crop is originally from Africa. So planting in a cold soil is going to either stunt it or greatly reduce its production or maybe it just doesn't germinate. So it is important to know those. I do have a resource I can show you really quick about that. Um, I can jump on here, looking this up here real quick. This is from Oregon State University. And I'm sorry that it did not jump into your packet, but it is a really nice one to have. I'm downloading it for you. It's also in Spanish, so you will get a Spanish translation. I'm gonna put it in the chat and I'm gonna share my screen real quick and I'll show you that resource. Okay, so here is that publication from Oregon State. And it shows you your minimum temperatures that you need. So, you know, we are talking about 37, 38 degrees on the weekly average in North Platte. So we're just above that minimum for lettuce and onions, for instance. So we're just starting to get to the point where we can plant some stuff. Once we get to 40, we have a lot more options. So look, so we got our, our cabbage, our, our cauliflowers. So a lot of our brassicas are in here. Some of our umble family is in here. Carrots can be planted at 40 degrees minimum. Uh, our goosefoot family, which is our beets and our spinach will be in there. Spinach actually will go down to 35 as well. But you have your cold temperatures, but then you have the ones that are warm temperature crops that need that warmth. So, you know, traditionally we have always seeded our squash, like you would go out and you'd plant the hill of watermelons or the hill of zucchini with seed. But now you can buy transplants, but you need to make sure that the soil is warm enough for those transplants to do well for you. So that's really important. And it tells you the optimal. So this is the minimum. And it tells you your optimal range for planting. So, and I really, I really like it. So uh, it's a really handy one. And we use it quite a bit for a lot of people to give them an idea. So, and I put it in the chat box for you. So I'll draw a stop sharing. What's the best way to terminate a cover crop? I know this may sound if you don't want to use the chemical method. And if it's and if there's still moisture, 
you can use a drip torch. A drip well, that's torch. a lot of fun. And burn it. <laughs> yeah. Please do not start a, a wildfire. But yes, a drip torch works really good. Fire can be a very good tool. And it's a very, it's a non-chemical one either. So you can till it under, uh, you know, like the tillage radishes. Uh, we have people that will till those tillage radishes in uh, or the turnips in and then that rots and then that gets the good flora going in your soil for your microbes. Um, you can disc it in, you can burn it, uh, you know, but when we have red flag warnings, we can't be doing that. <laughs> have to be really careful. Uh, those are ways to avoid using plain old fashioned Roundup. Mm -hmm. Great question, Gretchen. Any and other so, questions? This is the publication from the University of Wisconsin that you'll have on your email. So it's just a front and back. It's a great fact sheet. This is another one that I really like. This is from the University of California extension that ex that explains your plant families a little bit more for you. And it talks about the description and then the cultural characteristics. So for instance, um, the, the nightshade family, which is your tomato and pepper family. Most common diseases, many common diseases and pests, no surprise, tobacco mosaic, verticillium and fusarium, fungi and nematodes. So those are all soil problems. And then prefers rich, damp soil with lots of organic matter. So, uh, so that's one that I like. Here's the one about floating rope covers. It was also from the University of Wisconsin. So these are all downloadables that you can go to the website, download and print, or save to your hard drive. David, I don't think your link got transferred over to the chat for the Oregon resource. Okay, I'm going to do this again. So, okay, so I'm going to put it in the, okay, I just sent it. Oh, it was sent to just Lisa. I'm sorry. It needs to go to everyone. It was a, there you go. There you go. There's the link for you. So while we have the chat box up, download it, and then you can either print it or save it. So you questions we steal from lots of other states we have our goodies but we also pick out the things that are really important pinpoint to what you want um i've got a question on where do you recommend finding economical priced uh float covers the row cover material oh that's a good question um That is, I, I would recommend going to some of the, the trade shows like the Great Plains Growers Conference or um, the Local Foods Healthy Farms Conference um, that has some vendors there. And you can usually find, a lot of times you can make a, a good deal at a conference with them because they don't want to take it home. They want it gone. That's they want it gone. But I will, oh, the Great Plains Growers Conference, that happens every February. No, January, sorry. It happens every January in St. Joseph, Missouri. And then, um, and it's a five state conference and then the healthy local foods and healthy farms conference has been uh, that's here in Nebraska that happens in February. And that has happened in Aurora, Aurora, Nebraska for the past few years, but there's talk of moving that around the state so. Um, if you're interested in those conferences, David and I both get those. Um, announcements and we put them out on our websites so if you follow nebraska gardener on facebook or if you follow nebraska grows we'll have those when it comes time to um, start advertising for them and i'm going to send i'm putting some links here 
to those conferences directly into the chat box for everyone here. So, and I can be shameless too on Facebook. I'll show you my Facebook page for Nebraska Gardener. I did it as a as a spinoff to Nebraska Farmer because I do write for the Nebraska Farmer magazine. Every once in a while, they want a garden article. And so I'm going to send you the link to my page. And I post materials up usually on every Friday. So I will write, uh, I will, there it is. There's the link. Please like it. And then you'll get to follow all the goodies. I can share my screen and be a shameless promoter. Um, but it's really good to follow the, the stuff that we kind of share. And also tell you what we have. So this is, um, for instance, I will write an infographic. This is an infographic here of a picture and information that's really short, sweet to the point, and then my contact information. So this was basically condensing all the stuff from Oregon into a one slide. And so I write this in English and I also write it in Spanish. And I send it to my colleague, Sandra Barrera, uh, who puts it out on our Nebraska extension in Espanol family uh, page. So here is the Growing for Market series flyer. So we'll pull, I put stuff up here. This is one of my, um, we do a garden minute. Um, I do these on Fridays and I talk about a topic. This one was on uh, collecting soil samples and I am working on the audio. So it's a little bit better quality. And then we do me in YouTubes on how to test your garden soil temperature. So it'll take you straight to the YouTube post. So I like to work on media, I call it Media Friday. And I just put my information up and you can directly message me here. Happy to help and share it. Please share with all your friends. Tell them to like it too. And then Nebraska grows is specifically for commercial fruit and vegetable producers. I don't get into landscapes so much because um, that's not my target audience as an educator. My job is to work directly with commercial fruit and vegetable producers and within regional food systems. So I have a narrower focus than David has. He, he, he is a catch-all horticulturist and I'm a little more specialized, so. I never know Play where well the, together. Yes, <laughs> we have we really enjoy working together and sharing the goodies. And so no two days are ever alike in the extension world. So we never know what people may be asking or or what group we're going to be teaching. But this is our love of helping people have success growing vegetables, whether you are a commercial grower where Carol works primarily, and then I work with the home garden or helping people go up or, or what we call scaling up to sell at farmer's markets and giving ideas and suggestions. And I like to find the best ways to make as many win-win scenarios and get the bang for your buck too. So. You know, gardening can be very expensive. You you buy all the fancy stuff, but there's ways to make gardening very economical so you can save the money and maximize your profits. So in our last minute, I'm going to give a plug for next week. Jamie Bright is our speaker. She's going to be talking about uh, growing your business. So we'll be talking about business planning and all things pricing next week. So it'll be the same Zoom link, but I will I will email it out along with any uh, resources that Jamie has for us that night. So with that, I'm going to stop recording and thank everybody for being here tonight. I know it's not the best weather on the western half of the state. So I appreciate everybody um, coming tonight. Thank you for joining us.